Okay, so we're going to get going. And our first speaker today is Kurt Harris. He's the chief of the Human Carcinogenesis Lab. And for background purposes, Kurt got his MD from Kansas University School of Medicine. Subsequently, he did a residency in internal medicine at UCLA. And uh, He's received numerous awards, among them the Distinguished Service Medal from the U.S. Public Health Service. I was at his talk where he received the AACR Princess Takamoto Award, and he's published over 500 manuscripts. He's chief of the Journal of Carcinogenesis. His talk today, Integration of Cancer Biomarkers in Precision Medicine. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to be back. Uh, the, what you see in front of you is a tapestry. It was woven by uh, Claire and Denise about 10 years ago. She, they made uh, 10 of them. It's about Each one was about half the size of this screen. Uh, I use it as a metaphor in that I think that each scientist is contributing one thread. And where that thread is, how bright it is, is dependent on peers and history, but we're not doing the whole thing. We're just contributing. So this is a, if you want, team science or a collaboration kind of thing. So uh, precision medicine, well, that's an interesting uh, title. Uh, there are a number of, uh, it just recently joined the lexicon. It was, um, formulated by Francis Collins, uh, the head of the NIH, and that hoc uh, uh, IMO, that IOM, uh, Institute of Medicine uh, Committee, uh, did a report on it in 2011, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. The idea of personalized medicine has been around a long time. This is a quote from Hippocrates. And uh, it's far more important to know what sort of person the disease has than what sort of disease the person has. Interesting point. Uh, so let's talk about uh, traditional medicine and precision uh, medicine will follow. Traditional medicine, the kind that Terry and I learned, was uh, lifestyle, medical history, family history, science and symptoms, and standard uh, laboratory tests and uh, imaging. Precision medicine is multi-layered, individual-centric, and interconnected, and it combines all these various uh, omics with clinical and epidemiological information. And this is shown perhaps better here, that uh, this is called the information co commons. It's integrated, takes uh, big uh, data biocomputing, develop a knowledge network for a new molecular uh, taxonomic classification of patients to uh, hopefully improve uh, their diagnosis, health outcome, and treatment, and also guide uh, biomedical research that feeds back into the information commons, and also guide prevention research. As I said, this is National Academy of Science 2011. So now let's just look at some examples of this, and I'll uh, intersperse uh, inflammation, uh, which is the main topic uh, of uh, this particular uh, draco. Uh, and let's talk about expososome. Everything's got a nice name. Uh, it actually was coined by Chris Wilde um, 10 years ago. And um, this is from a cartoon that uh, Aaron Schechner and I uh, uh, prepared for a uh, commentary on a paper. And it involves the, the expososome involves the external environment, things that you're all familiar with, tobacco smoke, infections, uh, diet, so on and so forth, radiation. But it also involves the internal uh, environment that uh, is related to the external environment. So diet, obesity, chronic inflammation. And the two together lead to cancer biomarkers of risk of prognosis. In addition to this, there's a cancer genome and epigenome, genetic susceptibility driver genes that, that push toward uh, uh, cancer therapy. And, uh, but the understanding of carcinogenesis can also 
provide mechanistic uh, cancer biomarkers of risk and uh, prognosis. So chemicals that cause cancer, you're quite familiar with those, going back to the chimney sweep, causing scrotal cancer many centuries ago, actually. Aspergillus flavus that causes liver cancer and cigarettes that cause many kinds of cancer. And they cause mutations in genes such as the P53 gene. And in some cases, there is a pattern and some specificity in the type of mutation that occurs. Now let's go to inflammation, which is the other side of the uh, expososome. Chronic inflammation and, and infection can increase cancer risk. This is well known. It can be largely inherited. Uh, and examples of that are hemochromatosis and iron overload disease and increased risk of liver cancer, Crohn's and infection and also colitis, these are inflammatory bowel diseases that increase the uh, risk of colon cancer, and familiar uh, pancreatitis that can run in, in families like the Jimmy Carter family. More frequently, the inflammation is due to, uh, or the infection is due, is acquired, such as uh, viruses, bacteria, parasitic uh, organisms, and this leads to about 2 million uh, human cancers per year related to infection. And this comes from the World uh, Cancer Report that is produced by WHO, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. It just came out that I and many other people contributed to. But it doesn't take into account chemical, physical, and metabolic uh, examples that lead to uh, inflammation. And it could be acid reflux uh, that uh, causes Barrett's esophagus and increases the risk of esophageal cancer, obesity at many sites, which I'll talk about, and smoking. So smoking contains about 65 uh, different chemical carcinogens, but it's also a very potent inflammatory agent. So any of you who have taken a, a puff of a cigarette know that it causes a marked response in terms of, of your respiratory tree and Chronic, in, uh, chronic uh, smoking uh, is also associated with marked inflammation, chronic inflammation. So obesity. Obesity is, in fact, a chronic inflammatory disease that increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, and cancer. And there are two periods uh, in which I think some really interesting mechanistic work was done. The first period was around 2003, in which these two groups found that macrophages were infiltrated into body fat and were activated. And then uh, just a few years ago, it was found that uh, uh, diplocytes can undergo senescence. And when they undergo senescence, they produce large amounts of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the NF-kappa B pathway. So you have these uh, uh, senescent uh, diplocytes, and uh, you have activated macrophages producing uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines in, in feedback loops. So uh, that's one explanation. Another explanation is, well, is free radicals, which, which I probably won't say much about. So let's look at health disparity in the role of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines measured in serum in terms of risk factor for cancer, in this case lung cancer, diagnosis of cancer, or prognosis of cancer. So these are studies from, from our group primarily in which uh, we found that in this paper that IL-8 and CRP were both independent covariants in predicting cancer risk, lung cancer risk, as much as five to eight uh, years prior to development or diagnosis of cancer, I should say. At the time of diagnosis, there was still high levels of IL-8 and IL-6, both in Afro-Americans and European Americans. But in Afro-Americans, uh, interleukin-1 beta and a anti-inflammatory cytokine, IL-10, were increased. And prognosis, uh, there was poor survival if uh, IL-6 and IL-10, excuse me, IL-6 and IL-8 were increased. Manospinding lectin, is uh, something I'll mention in a moment. Uh, it uh, is associated with activation of the complement pathway in the innate uh, unity, and uh, TNF-alpha 
uh, and uh, these two, uh, IL-10 again and IL-12 in Afro-Americans. So let's just look at um, IL-6 and, and IL-8. This is a Kaplan-Meier plot. So this is 100% survival, 0% survival, five years, 10 years, 15 years. This is stage one lung cancer. So stage one lung cancer is the earliest uh, stage in which there's no evidence of metastases. Uh, the margins are clear, usually small tumors uh, of, uh, below five centimeters and stage 1A is below three centimeters. So if both of these in serum are low, relatively good prognosis, but as you can see, about 25% of these people who have surgery, curative surgery, pre uh, presumptively, uh, die of uh, uh, micrometastases and tumor recurrence after, after uh, 10 to 15 years. If either one of these is high, intermediate prognosis, but if both are high, uh, the 50% uh, uh, mortality is at five years. So this earliest stage cancer and um, uh, the uh, cytokines in the, in the uh, serum are predictive of, uh, of risk of recurrence. <coughs> Lung cancer um, is uh, the most common lethal cancer in the world. Uh, this is a Surgeon General report from 2014. Again, lots of us contributed to that. And uh, so it's 50 years of uh, Surgeon, Surgeon General report. And they were asking the question, um, how many premature deaths were there over those 50 years? And you'd be astonished at the answer. Over 20 million people have died of premature deaths due to smoking over a 50-year period, and not only cancer, but cardiovascular disease and others. For lung cancer, uh, this is the uh, plot over the last 10 years or so. Uh, in males, it's going down. In females, we hope that it's plateaued off or is going down. But it's still a very large number of people who die of lung cancer due to smoking in the United States. Now, a number of years ago, in fact, a long time ago, there was a meeting in Cape Sunyan on host factors in uh, cancer. And one of the people who presented his results for the very first time was Professor Hariyama. And uh, he made the first observation that secondhand smoke or passive smoke increased the risk of lung cancer. And at this time, very few people believed it. And, uh, but since then, it's quite obvious. There's 50 or 100, between 50 and 100 uh, papers now showing a increased risk of people who are around cigarette smoke and, uh, and uh, develop, uh, have an increased risk of, of lung cancer. This is another quotation from Hippocrates. This is one I particularly like. They use very flowery language at that point, which of course we don't do in science anymore. And it's some men have good constitutions that are like wooded mountains running with, with springs, others like those with poor soil and little water, still others like land rich in pastures and marshes, and yet others like the bare, dry earth of the plain. All right, so when I was at this meeting uh, in Greece, um, it occurred to me after listening to Hirayama's uh, lecture that infants and maybe in utero that are exposed to cigarette smoke from their parents might have an increased risk of developing lung cancer. Now, that was in 1981, and we couldn't do this study until about 2009, and that's Susan, Cancer Prevention Fellow, who's now at Ohio State. And why couldn't we do it earlier? Couldn't do it early because women didn't start smoking in the United States with increased frequency until the Second World War. Secondly, we needed enough time for those infants to grow up to be 50, 60 years of age so they would get lung cancer if they were going to get lung cancer. And then uh, lastly, um, to only look at never smokers. 
who get lung cancer. It's about 10 to 15 percent of the people who come into our clinic today. And so Susan tests the hypothesis that childhood exposure to secondhand smoke and genetic alterations in innate immunity increase lung cancer risk in never smoking adults. And the conclusion was that, that parental secondhand uh, smoke exposure from the, from the father or the mother, they, they, were too, they were additive, during childhood is associated with dose-dependent de uh, increase in lung cancer risk in never smokers in two different cohorts. And this was especially true with those with mannose binding uh, lectin-2 haplotype that leads to high levels of this protein, as I said earlier, is involved in innate immunity and in the uh, complement pathway. So they ha these people normally have, it's about a third of the population, that includes about a third of us in this room, have this haplotype, have a hyperreactive innate immune system. And one of the startling findings from this study was the early age of onset of lung cancer in these never smokers. So the ones that were exposed by their parents, they developed lung cancer in their 50s. The ones that weren't exposed, but maybe exposed to secondhand smoke elsewhere, or were just never smoke that were never smokers, developed lung cancer 10 years later in the mid 60s. All right, uh, genome. I'm just going down the list here. So uh, lung cancer, again, the traditional view many years ago was you had small cell uh, lung cancer, squamous cell, uh, or adenocarcinoma. In 1987, KRAS was discovered. In uh, 2004, EGFR was discovered to be mutated in lung cancer, but these were mutually exclusive between lung cancers that had KRAS or EGFR. And the HRR, EGFR uh, mutations in lung cancer were almost exclusively in never smokers. And then 2014, uh, a, a many more uh, quite rare mutations were found primarily, again, in never smokers, such as out fusions. And, um, and EGFR is here, and KRAS. What isn't here is P53. So P53, a tumor suppressor, is mutated in maybe 60 to 70 percent of lung cancers, depending on whether it's squamous cell, which is higher, or adeno, which is a little bit lower. All right, epigenome. All right. Now, there are many aspects of the epigenome. It can be DNA methylation. It can be microRNAs or non-coding RNAs. It could be chromatin remodeling. There's uh, many different possibilities. But I'm just going to focus on microRNAs and the interaction between microRNAs and inflammation. So these are small non-coding RNAs that are evolutionarily conserved and regulate gene expression. And um, the, the two people who get most credit, or the person who gets most credit, is Victor Ambrose, who just got three million bucks uh, at the breakthrough meeting uh, in uh, with the uh, Hollywood people uh, in uh, Los Angeles just recently? So he has a bigger smile now. And uh, Gary was a colleague uh, in, at the same institution who actually uh, helped identify targets of microRNA. So these studies were done in C. elegans in the early 1990s in which they discovered microRNA. But microRNAs are evolutionally very old. You can find them in plants. The other interesting thing is that their targets are multiple, like hundreds of targets. So when we do antisense kind of experiments in the laboratory, we do everything possible to have no off-target effects. But microRNAs, that's how they function. They function by affecting many targets in many pathways and sometimes in the same pathway. So it's evolutionarily conserved to work that way. So about 10 years later, this guy, Carlo Croce, colleague in, of mine and collaborator, made a seminal observation that in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, there were two microRNAs that were lost, MIR-15 and MIR-16. That was the first paper. 
And since then, there are about 10,000 papers on, on cancer and microRNAs, and there's an equal number in other disease states. So he really started the interest in, in finding that microRNAs are differentially expressed in human cancers, and we and others have been asking questions about uh, uh, risk, diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutic outcome, and interaction with inflammation and, and other risk factors. So uh, they have many targets. They have primarily two functions. One is that they bind to messages, in the, and these messages are, are inhibited in terms of their translation, or they bind to the message and cause instability of message RNA. But they also bind to proteins, including uh, RMPs, uh, RNA uh, inhibitory proteins, and, and inactivate them. And then lastly, and I'll return to this at the very end, they can act as ligands. So particularly MIR-21 can bind to, in a very specific way, to toll receptors in humans and mice and activate the NF-kappa B pathway and increase IL-6, TNF-alpha, and all the uh, uh, inflammatory response associated with NF-kappa B inflammation. So we got interested in this uh, in lung cancer. And uh, this is an Nzumo who was asked the question about, well, about diagnosis and prognosis and found that microRNA profiles were significantly different between both primary lung cancers and non-cancer and, and, and among different histological types. So you could distinguish adeno squamous from small cell. And to go back to stage one lung cancers, again, found that increased MIR-21, 155, and 106 act as oncogenes, if you want. And there's decrease in LET7, which acts, if you want, as a tumor suppressor gene. And the LET7 results confirm previous results by Tak Takahashi, who is in Nagoya, and Frank Slack, who just moved from, from Yale, Yale to uh, Harvard. Now, we also collaborated with Carlo uh, Croce to ask the question, among the six major lethal kinds of cancer, which of the microRNAs that were known at that time, and there were about 280 known, there now there are close to 2,000 microRNAs that had been annotated. But at that time, there was about 280. So we asked the question in breast, colon, lung, uh, prostate, uh, pancreas, and stomach, which of the microRNAs was most highly upregulated? And one of these came up to the top of the list that was called MIR-21. I mentioned it in the last slide. And since uh, this initial uh, paper was published, MIR-21 is both upregulated in 18 major cancer types, not only six, but 18, and is a biomarker uh, survival at 14. So this is one of the things we and a lot of other people do is look at multiple cohorts. These are Kaplan-Meier plots, again, 100% survival, 0%. This is time and months and high levels of MIR-21 in each of these populations was associated with poor uh, prognosis. As I said, there were um, 14 different cancer types that are associated, MIR-21 levels are associated with prognosis. This is about 10 of those, and uh, lung and colon is what we've studied, but pancreas goes on and on, and there are several others. And each one of these has been validated by several other studies. So this is a quite a common finding. And it's true in colon cancer, uh, and these are two populations that uh, Aaron uh, in our group studied, Maryland uh, cohort and a Hong Kong cohort with S.Y. Long for prognosis. And uh, since then, there have been three other studies that have validated uh, those results. Now, how about therapy? Uh, this is Charlie Heidelberger, who died about uh, 15, 20 years ago, writing the structure of 5-FU here. He discovered it 50 years ago or more, still being used in the clinic today for a variety of cancer types. And MIR-21, high levels, poor prognosis for colon cancer in the Japan and uh, German cohort. And it's a confirmation of a study in a previous slide in uh, Hong Kong in the U.S. So there are four different cohorts 
uh, have found the same thing. So um, before going to the combination of, of microRNAs and inflammation, uh, there is a lot of work that's been done by many people in terms of providing a mechanistic underpinning of MIR-21 in human cancer. So MIR-21 is a non-coding gene, so it can be amplified to lead to an increase. It's controlled in part by uh, DNA methylation, so uh, a decrease in, in uh, DNA methylation can lead to an increase. We show that EGFR or KRAS, again, these are mutually exclusive, but in the same pathway can increase uh, MIR-21. Um, David Baltimore found that several of the inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6, through STAT-3, which is a promoter of MIR-21, this leads to phosphorylation of STAT3, which then is active in promoting lots of genes, including MIR21. And in collaboration with Jim Miller and Nicole Simon when she was here, we did a study of gen genotoxic stress, either hydrogen peroxide or ionizing radiation, and that increases MIR21. Now, what's downstream from MIR21? There's many, many downstream targets. The one that's are listed in, on this slide are ones that have been validated in the laboratory. So they're not just algorithm produced, uh, predicted uh, targets. These are real targets. Uh, and these are selected on the basis that they're involved in cancer in various ways. So high levels of MIR-21 actually decreases the protein level of all of these uh, different uh, gene products. And as I mentioned, MIR-21 uh, uh, activates the inflammatory pathway, and as I'll show you, cachexia. And uh, I'll tell you why cachexia is so important. So this is a cartoon that prepared, and it makes several points. One is that cancers can produce uh, microRNAs and package them in microvesicles. They call them exosomes. These exosomes can then transfer the microRNAs to immune cells, such as macrophages, and through the, the uh, uh, toll receptor, lead to an increase in MKPP, B, producing uh, these cytokines that can increase growth and, and, and metastatic potential. <clears throat> but they can also be transferred to muscle cells and activate uh, MIR-21, and the MIR-21 can activate the toll receptor increase uh, NF-kappa B and cause lysis or apoptosis of muscle cells. <clears throat> so why is that of, of any curiosity? Well, those of you who, who may be associated with uh, cancer care know that uh, for certain cancer types, such as pancreas and uh, sometimes lung cancer, there is a syndrome called cachexia. And cachexia is essentially wasting of muscle and fat so these people die quite a terrible death, and there's nothing so far you can do for them, so far. And it looks like one of these microRNAs might be the cause of this, and that antimers against this microRNA might be, have some therapeutic value. We'll see. <clears throat> so now let's go back to colon cancer, and Jane and Aaron did these studies, and the hypothesis was that Inflammatory risk score in tumor versus non-tumor, so that we looked at about 42 different uh, uh, inflammatory-related genes, uh, would correlate with colon cancer-specific mortality independent of tumor stage. And we found that there was contribution by cytokines and inflammatory uh, proteins in the adjacent colon as well as in the cancer. So in the adjacent colon, these were increased, including IL-10, which was associated with nodal metastasis. So it's an anti-inflammatory cytokine. Issue. In the colon cancer itself, these uh, were increased, and including uh, IL-23, uh, uh, which uh, increases the proliferation of TH17 cells and production of IL-17. Uh, and um, um, so... IL-17 frequently is associated with increased uh, cancer uh, uh, progression. So what happens if you combine these inflammatory 
biomarkers in MIR-21. Uh, and is it a better prognostic classifier of colon cancer than either one uh, than the other? <clears throat> so the inflammatory risk score, which is the, cy the cytokine genes that I just mentioned, Kaplan-Meier plots, 100% survival, 0%. And the median survival cancer, uh, colon cancer-specific mortality was about 30 months. MIR-21, high levels of expression above the median. Uh, in the same group of individuals, the uh, median was about 27 months. However, the combination of the two gave quite interesting results. If they were both low, quite good prognosis. If either one was high, intermediate prognosis. And if both high, very poor prognosis, and the median survival was for 17 months. Now, it's important to take these kinds of data to statistical analysis, including multivariate analysis, in which it's simply asking the question, is each covariant independent of the other covariants? And I, the inflammatory risk score is independent. These are hazard ratios of MIR-21, which is independent of it, and also they're both independent of tumor stage. So what might be the principle uh, for this? Uh, this is what we propose, that each kind of biomarker, for example, non-coding RNA or coding RNA, when they combine, they give you curves that look like this that you've already seen, and they can both uh, with some degree of precision and accuracy uh, in agreement, identify people who are, are, uh, have cancer or have a good prognosis, I should say. And, uh, but each of these biomarkers misclassifies some people. So the coding RNA misclassified these, non-coding RNA misclassified these. So the two together is better than just one. If you put three different independent covariants together, such as adding uh, DNA methylation to this. Is that better than these two? The answer is yes. If you put four independent covariants together, is that better than three? We're testing that right now. So is this only true in colon cancer? The answer is no. It's true in esophageal cancer, both adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, and in lung adenocarcinoma and also in an independent study in breast cancer. So this is Evie and Zhang. Zhang was a, a uh, Oxford fellow and MD, PhD, and uh, just finished uh, training at Duke uh, for a medical uh, degree. And uh, so they looked at uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. So you recognize these Kaplan-Meier plots. And I show you this in part because for adenocarcinoma, the inflammatory risk score, which is different from colon cancer, and a decrease in MIR-375, if you want a tuber suppressor gene, are associated as, as robust prognostic classifiers. In squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, Adeno is primarily due to Barrett's and acid reflux. Squamous cells primarily due to smoking. Uh, MIR-21, 146, and 182 were increased, and inflammatory risk score was also increased. So different uh, uh, cytokines here again in the inflammatory risk score and different microRNAs. But you still see a common result. The combination of independent covariances is poorer than than, or as, as I should say, is better than a single uh, independent biomarker. Ooh, I did something bad. Okay, there we go. So very briefly, uh, lung cancer and uh, combining not inflammatory genes, but other related genes, which I'll describe in just a moment, and the combination of uh, MIR-21. And this is stage one lung cancer. And the four genes, the uh, protein coding genes was uh, XPO1, which is involved in transport of microRNAs and other molecules from nucleus to cytoplasm. BRCA1, that you're very familiar with, is involved in molecules recombination and mutations, increased risk of, of breast cancer. And HIF1-alpha, which is uh, uh, the protein is increased in hypoxia 
and its expression is increased by alpha keto keto ketoglutarate and, and a variety of other metabolites that are involved in the tumor metabolism. So this is a Japanese cohort, primarily stage 1A, three centimeters or less, uh, and uh, the the four gene signature prediction is here, and MIR21 is here. If you put the two together, uh, the combination is worse here. And in a population from the U.S. and Norway, we found, again, these were primarily stage 1B patients, no evidence of metastases, but the tumors were about five centimeters uh, in size. And uh, again, there was an association with poor prognosis with the 4-gene signature or high levels of MIR-21, poor prognosis. And if they're both low, good prognosis, either one high, intermediate prognosis. If they're both high, uh, quite poor prognosis. All right, let's say something about the microbiome because that's a very hot topic right now, and there's a very strong inflammatory aspect of this. So in our group, uh, Lee Greathouse is, uh, in, uh, is investigating this uh, with collaborations with Julie Segray and, and others, and asking the question about uh, the microbes that uh, populate our body surfaces and both internal and uh, external body surfaces and their role in disease. And this, as I said, is quite a hot and interesting uh, topic. Now, it's been long known that certain micro as infectious agents are associated with increased cancer risk. And as I said, about 15 to 20 percent of cancers worldwide are associated with infectious agents. And that was on that previous table uh, that I, I showed. Uh, examples of specific uh, microbes associated with cancer are HPV and head and neck cancer, liver cancer, hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus and in gastric cancers, H. pylori. Now, whenever there is a break in the mucosa barrier due to some sort of injury, free radicals or, or uh, a tumor starting to arise, a dysplastic lesion, uh, the microbes that are in that body space, that interior space, whether it's the the stomach or the intestine or the respiratory tract, uh, they invade into the, into the uh, mucosa. And this leads to an inflammatory response, including uh, uh, interleukin-23 that I mentioned before, interleukin-17, which I mentioned before, and STAT-3 that's activated. So are there uh, communities or specific uh, microbes that are associated with, in this case, colon cancer? And uh, a few years ago now, uh, Fusarium bacterium uh, was found in colon cancer, uh, but not in the adjacent uh, tumor. And uh, it was quite prevalent in, uh, in uh, colon cancer. Uh, and this is a tumor, and that's just showing uh, an area. And more mechanistic studies have shown that this bacteria, bacteria is enriched in human adenomas, uh, suggesting an early role in tumor genesis, that it accelerates tumor genesis in a colon uh, cancer model uh, mouse, uh, and that it drives myeloid infiltration into intestinal tumors, and is associated with a pro-inflammatory signature both in mouse and human tumors. I did mention that there are 10 to 100 times more microbes that we carry around than we have actual cells. So we're talking trillions of microbes. So uh, the microbiome and cancer, uh, the core human microbiome, uh, Ge geography uh, makes a difference, so host uh, uh, environment factors. Uh, diet, smoking, obesity makes a difference. Uh, various single nucleotide polymorphisms and mutations make a difference. And 
co-receptors and cytokines. And, and the, the, one of the more amusing things that just was published is kissing makes a difference. So um, when you kiss someone, you transfer about 8 million uh, microbes if it's a juicy kiss, but only about 800,000 or less if it's a very light peck. So people who kiss come frequently, let's say you and your spouse, uh, develop the, the microbiota in, in the mouth in a very similar way. Now, this is a very interesting cartoon, uh, which I assume would get your attention. This was published in the New York Times uh, a year ago, and uh, a little more than a year ago. And it was about a study that was, in, uh, that was published. And, this, and it, it uh, makes a point of fecal transplants, or transfers from one person to the other. You might say, well, this is a pretty crazy idea. Uh, but homeopathic medicine has been doing this for a long time. And in some cases, it's being done for treatment of inflammatory bowel disease or other kinds of, of uh, acute infection. So uh, in that case, the microbes are, are isolated from the feces and then are put into capsules. So this is not so uh, foreign that it's, it's actually happening and has been happening for a long time, but now on, under a more scientific basis. And the last thing I'll talk about is the uh, metabolome. So that's a reflection of uh, tumor metabolism. And uh, Maya and Evie have done these studies. It's unbiased uh, uh, metabolomics will discover biomarkers associated with risk, diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutic outcome of lung cancer. And we have a wonderful collaboration with Frank Gonzalez, who's also at Building 31 and one of the world's experts on uh, metabolomics. So this is a very nice uh, picture that goes back uh, to 1653. And... Uh, this is my third quotation from Hippocrates. Hippocrates tasted urine in the diagnosis of disease of his patient. And this was quite common. When I went to medical school, fortunately, we didn't have to taste urine. We had other ways of doing it. But it's been uh, uh, a, a source of, of uh, getting information from patients, diabetes, that goes back centuries. Well, a uh, physiologist named Armstrong uh, some time ago wrote, from a liquid window through which physicians felt they could view the body's inner working led to the beginnings of laboratory medicine. So one of the biofluids we study is, in fact, urine. And we've uh, studied by uh, LC Masbeck and then triple quad uh, the metabolites that are 1,500... Uh, uh, molecular weight and less. And we're quite interested in lung cancer, but other cancers too, in Afro-American versus European-American. And found that the metabolites in Afro-Americans can be quite different from metabolites in European-Americans, but there's a common group of metabolites. And we selected 10 of these out of that common group and asked the question whether or not they were associated with diagnosis of of lung cancer. And these are called rock curves. They are really sensitivity and specificity curves. And this is the line here. But uh, the area uh, uh, under the curve, this part right here, when it's uh, above 0.7 uh, to 8 or 9, is usually highly significant. And so this is in a training set and in a test set a sizable number of cases that control quite a similar result. This is a little bit below 0.8. This is somewhat above 0.8. Now, this is one strategy of taking a large cohort, dividing it in half in a random way, 
uh, and then doing the analysis. More, more valid than that is doing multiple cohorts, and we're involved in doing those kinds of studies now. Another thing you can do is combine the micro, excuse me, the metabol metabolites, metabolites, and uh, out of that 10, four of these uh, were utilized, uh, and these are Kaplan-Meier plots, 100% survival, 0% survival, and this is a five-year point, and these are lung cancers. And um, so all four of them together were much more predictive than three or two or one uh, in terms of predicting uh, cancer uh, prognosis. And these are this is the multivariate analysis down here, the hazard ratios showing that three is by far the best, or four, all four, is even better. Uh, and two of these, creatinine riboside and N-acetyl neuroaminic acid, were also found in the tumor. So we asked the question, was there a correlation to what's found in the tumor with what's found in the urine? And the answer is that if lung adenocarcinomas, high levels of creatinine riboside were found in the tumor compared to the non -tumor. And there was a positive correlation between the amount in the tumor and the amount in the urine. So this biomarker was reflecting what is found in the tumor, a tumor metabolite, but you could measure it in your. So let's end up with a current problem that uh, Terry and I and others who are involved in, in lung cancer research are, are facing, and that is the screening of uh, small uh, of people, large numbers of people, ages 55 to 70. And um, this has led to uh, Medicare probably approving Spiral CT or low dose CT for screening. And this was uh, published at New England Journal of Medicine in 11. And compared to x rays, which are known to be lousy, there was about a 20% reduced mortality with uh, the low dose uh, CT. However, there are lots of very small lesions that were, were discovered, and the vast majority of these are not cancer. 96% false positive. The ones that prove to be cancer are very early stage cancer, stage one and stage 1A particularly. So there's going to be thousands of people, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people going through this kind of screening and coming up with some lung cancer in about four or five percent, but many of them, we don't know what they have. So why are we going to uh, deal with that? There are several different strategies that we won't go into now, but we can discuss if anyone's curious about that. And I mentioned that uh, even after cur uh, curative, uh, presumed curative uh, surgery, 25 percent of stage one lung cancers die of their disease. So we'd be very interested in identifying those that are low risk versus high risk and then developing appropriate therapies because right now you just wait until they have it recurrent. And how to do that? Precision medicine. And, it de and the objective is decrease false policy rate, decrease financial costs, improve patient care, and guide mechanistic studies so that one can take these high risk individuals, put them in randomized trials with these very early stage cancers which they don't get any treatment now, and ask the question whether adjuvant immunotherapy or chemotherapy will have some benefit. So this is a summary of what I've gone through in about 15 minutes. Um, i talked a lot about precision medicine and the cancer biomarkers of risk, diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutic outcome. I focused, uh, I could have focused on several microRNAs, but I focused on MIR-21 because there's lots of mechanistic and it's uh, data, and it's an oncogenic biomarker in human cancer. It's involved in diagnosis, prognosis, therapeutic outcome. Combination of validated mechanistic and statistically independent cancer biomarkers, such as protein coding, 
whether that's inflammatory uh, uh, genes or even non-inflammatory genes in microRNA, is a better prognostic classifier in these cancer types than either one alone. Serum inflammatory cytokines, particularly IL-6 and IL-8, are associated with lung cancer risk, diagnosis, and prognosis. Uh, the microbiome may modulate carcinogenesis and tumor progression and could offer as being uh, uh, a therapeutic targets. So if you have a specific uh, uh, microbe that is associated with, uh, with uh, cancer risk or diagnosis, uh, having antibiotics might have some benefit. So using a vaccine to human papillomavirus has great benefit. Using uh, antibiotics for uh, helicobacter has benefit. And now there are therapies for both, I should say, there, there's a vaccine for hepatitis B virus, and there's several therapies, including one that uses microRNAs as a target for hepatitis C. And uh, that uh, metaboloma analysis of body fluids can help, and is it a biomarker of risk? Just it almost completed a, bi of a prospective study, and the answer is yes. And then I, I mentioned a, a really uh, urgent uh, clinical uh, need for improving the diagnosis of, uh, of lung cancer in an early stage and prediction of those who will have an early recurrence. So this goes back to the precision medicine uh, paradigm, and this is just some of the examples that <coughs> I gave. And the the last year's, uh, I guess this this year's uh, extramural uh, report uh, focuses the attention on precision medicine, and this is the cover of it, and uh, which I provided, it, and uh, some of the dialogue uh, it, with it. So there's a lot of interest both in the intramural and extramural community about precision medicine. And these are my coworkers and collaborators. These are people who are either in the lab now or have been in the lab. And these are a list of some of the people that we've had the privilege of collaborating with. And one of the things I enjoy and I most is interaction with postdocs and fellows. And they teach me something every day. Hopefully, I teach them something. They teach me something every day. And it's, a, it's quite a joy. So, thank you for your attention. So, what do you think would happen if we were to be able to stop the How would that affect? Well, as, as Terry is implying, the exosomes. Um, are a transport mechanism, not only for microRNAs, but for messages and, and protein, these small microvesicles. And then they fuse with other cells and then transfer the content. So there's a lot of interest in exosomes uh, at this point in microvesicles. They have specific uh, proteins on their cell surface. So one could, in fact, uh, uh, maybe using antibodies to try to, to alter their function. But they can be transport mechanisms for therapy. So you can uh, make microvesicles and insert into them drugs or, in this case, microRNAs, and then give those microvesicles to people. So this is a, a new transport mechanism for drugs and for small molecules that uh, a number of companies are working on right now. And I was uh, giving a talk in San Diego at the AAPS, American Association of Pharmaceutical Science, uh, Scientists. Uh, it's one of the federations. And there were a number of companies that are making anti-mirrors, that are putting microRNAs into vesicles. And uh, there's even a phase two study ongoing uh, with treatment of uh, colon cancer patients uh, with a tumor suppressor microRNA. So it's a brave new world out there. Who's going to uh, take some fecal transplant? Any volunteer? Thank you, Terry. 
All right. Okay, so our next talk will be given by Jun Wei, and uh, he got his PhD degree at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. Subsequently, he joined the NCI working with Paul Meltzer in cancer genetics, and currently he's working with Shavit Khan. The title, The Application of Genomics to Identify Diagnostic Biomarkers, Drivers, and Therapeutic Targets for Pediatric Cancers. Thank you, Terry, for asking me uh, to give this uh, lecture. Uh, it's uh, really my pleasure to give you an overview of how to use genomics uh, uh, research to do the research, and also hopefully I will uh, show you some example to use the genomic research in the clinical setting. Oops. I use this. Okay, um, this is the outline for today's uh, uh, seminar. Uh, I'm going to give you some background on the success and the challenges in treating pediatric cancers. Um, because our lab is interested in the pediatric cancer uh, research. And uh, I'm also going to tell you um, the uh, application of genomics to discover the biomarkers, drivers, and the therapeutic targets in the pediatric cancer. And, uh, and the, so the, uh, some concept, uh, concept in the genomics, and uh, this is a tool uh, examples to uh, to uh, study the, the role of FGFR4 in the rhabdomyosarcoma, the pediatric, pediatric cancer, and also how to uh, do the translational genomics and the uh, personalized med uh, therapy. And I realized that the Dr. Harris just gave you the uh, lecture concerning of the uh, precision uh, medicine. So I, I think it's going to be I'm going to be uh, brief on those uh, points. Hope, hopefully, we won't have too much overlap. Uh, this slide just shows that historically the pediatric cancer uh, cure rate is uh, improved a lot. You can see this is the in, uh, cure rate, in, survival rate in the uh, 60s. And by 90s, you can see uh, a lot of pediatric cancer is curable now. However, uh, in the last uh, about uh, uh, 20 years, uh, the successful rate is uh, level off. And this is the, uh, from the Sears data uh, to show, this is easier for you to see. Uh, this is uh, all the cancer uh, the, uh, mortality rate, uh, it's keep on going down. Uh, this is the lymphoma and the leukemia, which is the blood cancer of the children. But the, the recent, uh, about two decades or so, you see this uh, mortality rate is uh, level off. So that means um, the progress in the last 20 years is not as fast as before. So, <clears throat> and this slide shows, shows the same, same kind of things. So uh, the cure rate for the high risk disease uh, it, the cure rate is uh, higher, but for some cancer, uh, for example, the uh, brain stem uh, glioma, the cure rate is about the same in the 60s and 90s. And uh, this is the same thing in the uh, Ewing sarcoma. For some uh, uh, lo localized disease, the cure rate is fairly high, but if it's a metastasis disease, the cure rate is still low. And this is a uh, this is saying this, uh, other tumors as well. As long as there's a metastatic disease, the cure rate is still pretty low. So that's the challenge of the uh, uh, pediatric cancer now. So with the metastatic disease, the cure rate is still, uh, is still pretty low. So we want to find what is the new target and uh, uh, the new therapies for those disease. By the way, those are all uh, those improved the rate uh, basically is due to the uh, advance in the chemotherapy and uh, also the multi multi module therapy means a combination of the chemotherapy and also radiation therapy 
uh, bone marrow transplant or those. It's a very aggressive therapy in this disease. So here I give you some de definition of the biomarker. Uh, the biomarker is uh, basically is a characteristic uh, that is uh, can be objectively measured and evaluated uh, to use for clinical use, either diagnosis, prognosis, and uh, uh, to for the patho pathological uh, process or the pharmacological response to therapeutic intervention. Uh, another concept I need to. Uh, Define the driver. So the driver is basically the genomic alteration that caused the implicate, implicated in the oncogenesis or tumor survival. Such a mutation can be positively selected during the uh, tumor genesis and often shows a recur recurrent pattern way within or across tumor types. This is the opposite of the passenger events which arise from the pack, uh, background mutation rate, I do not contribute to a uh, disease, the cancer, uh, cancer process. So this is a driver concept. There's another concept that I'm using the target, the therapeutic target. Uh, so there's two ca categories of therapeutic target. One is a, a molecule or protein that, that is differentially expressed in a tumor, which can be used to home in the uh, lethal therapy. For example, if you use uh, conjugated uh, antibody uh, uh, against a specific tumor to deliver uh, a, a toxic uh, therapy, so that, that will be falling in this category. There's another category is uh, if the target of the molecule, you can use a small molecule or some other agent to, to inhibit its function or or its downstream uh, molecules that can lead to tumor, tumor growth suppression or even better the aggression or the death of the tumor. So this is two categories of uh, therapeutic target. So in the perfect scenario is uh, if we can find a molecule that can, can be used as a biomarker, at the same time it is very important for this cancer as a driver, and uh, of course we can target at the uh, therapeutic target. That's the perfect scenario. But we know that the life is always not this simple. Usually uh, a biomarker uh, sometimes can be just a surrogate or nothing to do with the tumor biology. For example, this tumor has some surface molecule that can be very specific. Uh, for example, the CD99 uh, or the MIC, uh, MIC gene, the uh, Ewing sarcoma, they can be very specific to this uh, uh, tumor, but if you target it, it doesn't do anything. And uh, another category is the driver may not be easily to, to be targeted. For example, the transcription factor, like, uh, like uh, MIC N, and uh, those uh, PEC3. Fox01 and the EWS fly. This is the uh, fusion gene that is uh, generated by the translocation of the chromosome. And uh, both uh, molecules are a novel uh, transcription factor. They drive the transcription of the genes. So all this target currently is uh, harder to target. But on the other hand, if it's a uh, kinase, uh, a tyrosine kinase or other kinase, it's easier to use a small molecule to, to inhibit its function. So this uh, slide just show you uh, the central dog dogma. So the biological information flowed from a genomic DNA to RNA and then translated into protein. And uh, this line was divided the area of a genomic at the proteomic. Um, and you know this uh, system is very uh, complicated. It's not a, a sing single direction information flow. And uh, those, uh, these are feedback loops because the protein will regulate the DNA, uh, the translation, uh, transcription process, and also the translation process. 
And uh, on the top of that, there's a microRNA. Uh, you probably heard from the Harris uh, talk. And uh, there's a, uh, this is a fairly uh, newly discovered category of a molecule that is very important to, uh, to regulate the whole genome and this information flow. And uh, also recently, the, um, uh, the ANCOR project uh, revealed that uh, about 80% of the whole genome is functional. You know, in the past, we always think it's only a very small portion of genome is, is useful. The rest is junk DNA. But the ANCOR study shows 80% of the genome is, trans, uh, is transcribed. So a lot of those uh, uh, molecules is made to regulate when and the where and the how those uh, 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 genes uh, function in a particular cell. So it's a very complicated system. And uh, in the very early days, this is almost like almost 20 years uh, ago that uh, when the uh, the time we started doing this kind of a study because of the availability of the genomic tool at that time. Uh, this is the early days when we have the cDNA microarray. Micro okay. um, so this is a study uh, uh, we, we did with a very, compared to nowadays standard, is a very uh, small cDNA array. We only have about 4,000 probes on uh, when one DNA array. Uh, compared to nowadays, the whole genome ar ar array, you can have like tens of thousands of probes on it. So in these studies, we try to um, use this DNA microarray to do the diagnosis of cancer. Because in this category of a PDIG cancer, which is called a small round blue cell tumor, they are exactly look like this under the microscope. They are small, round, blue, <laughs> this kind of cell, okay? So with the HE staining, they look very alike. Uh, so at that time, we think our hypothesis is can we use gene expression array to distinguish them, okay? Uh, that's the uh, idea. Uh, the reason we want to do this is because those is a very highly, these are all highly malignant uh, solid tumor, they're coming from different tissue. And, uh, but they look very similar in the histology, uh, routine histology, but they have very different uh, treatment and the outcome. So the diagnosis is very important for how to treat those cancers. And uh, this is uh, the study we published in the Nature Medicine. Uh, again, uh, we use a very moderate uh, array uh, to perform this study. And we also used the artificial neural network at that time to uh, do the pattern recognition of the gene expression among those uh, uh, different cancers. You can see these are four different cancers, the Ewing, uh, Ewing sarcoma, neuroblastoma, Raptor-Myers sarcoma, and the Berg's lymphoma. And from this study, we detect uh, these marker, no markers that we know that is uh, specifically uh, expressed in particular tumor. In this, in this case, this is the molecule again, this is the MIG2. I pointed out uh, earlier, also called the CD99. It's very specifically uh, expressed in the Ewing sarcoma. Uh, again, here, this, this heat map, the red means uh, high expression, where, where the uh, green means low expression. So you can see this particular molecule is very specific, specifically expressed in Ewing sarcoma. This is, this is the marker, marker they use to diagnose Ewing in the, in the clinic. Another example uh, is this uh, very specific expression of uh, FGFR4 and the IGF, IGFR, IGF2 molecules in the rhabdomyosarcoma, okay? And this molecule I'm going to talk about later. Uh, so from this study, we identified 40, 41 genes that are not previously reported to express in this category of tumor. 
And uh, so we can use uh, those markers as novel diagnostic uh, markers. And the, lately, we developed this uh, diagnostic mark, uh, assay with this uh, company called Athea Diagnostic. And uh, also, the expression of those markers in those cancers also implicate their biology of those cancers. And we can also use these uh, highly expressed genes, highly specifically expressed genes as a candidate therapeutic target. So here I want to show you one of the use of this diagnostic assay. Uh, so at that time, uh, there's a, a five years uh, little girls uh, seek for the second uh, opinions from the pediatric oncology branch. And this patient actually is a ger German patient from uh, uh, old colleagues from uh, PLB. So she had a, a history of a weight loss and uh, reduced the appetite and the favor of abdominal pain. And uh, on the examination, uh, shows there's a, a big left side abdominal mass. And the CD scan shows that uh, there's a big mass on, uh, on the top of the left kidney. And also there's a mass in the uh, inferior vena cava. And they cannot do biopsy on this patient because the risk of bleeding. And the uh, ur urine catecholamine uh, examination is uh, negative, and the MIBG scan is negative. So this is all the uh, uh, test for the neuroblastoma. Uh, so that's the reason they, at that time they were diagnosed, this girl was diagnosed as the Williams tumor, and they started a chemotherapy on her. But uh, lately, uh, she had a, a tumor uh, excision. So after the histology is done, they discovered it's not a Williams tumor. Instead, it looks like an undifferentiated neuroblastoma. So that's the reason they contact the POB, ask for a second opinion. So we used this diagnostic assay to perform the gene expression on this test sample. And this is an unsupervised supervised uh, uh, clustering with uh, uh, the biomarker we discovered from the previous study. And you can see the clustering of this sample is uh, uh, tightly clustered with neuroblastoma, not with the uh, Welps tumor or rhabdomyosarcoma. So, so from using this assay, we can see it, it, it is a, a neuroblastoma. And this is a microarray uh, experiment we using uh, uh, at that time. It's a, a commercial available array, which is apimetric plus two. Uh, it's it's much a bigger array now, um, and uh, confirmed the diagnosis of the uh, neuroblastoma is not a uh, Williams. You can see this. Uh, this is the PCA analysis. This is all the neuroblastoma uh, in blue. This is the test sample. It's clustered with this group, but not with the other one. This is the Williams here, so it's quite a distance. So this is confirmed. This uh, tumor indeed is probably uh, indeed is a neuroblastoma. So this is uh, uh, after the change of uh, the diagnosis. Uh, this patient was switched to the high-risk neuroblastoma treatment including a stem cell uh, transplant. And uh, the, this girl is doing well even a year after the diagnosis. So here is a, a very good example to show how we use genomics to discover the diagnosis, uh, diagnosis marker uh, readily to use in the clinic. So, um, now I want to give you another example of how, how do we identify uh, our potential uh, therapeutic target uh, in rhabdomyosarcoma. So this uh, rhabdomyosarcoma is uh, arised from progenitor cells of striated skeletal muscle. 
and is the third most common soft tissue sarcomas in children. It's about 5% in the, uh, among the, all the uh, pediatric cancer. So the incident is about 4.3 cases per, mil, uh, per million children. Uh, in the whole United States, it's about 350 new cases a year. Uh, so it's a very rare disease. There's a two kinds of histology subtype. One is the majority is a, called an embryo. Um, <clears throat> usually it's uh, characteristic with the 11P15 LOH. And the, another category uh, uh, is alveolar uh, histology uh, subtype. This one is uh, characteristic with the translocation, either the uh, chromosome 2, 13, or 1, 13 translocation resulting into this PAC3 or PAC7 FOXL1 fusion gene. And this alveolar usually it's, uh, uh, the, the survival rate is uh, lower than the embryonic, uh, embryonic uh, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. Cycle. So this is a, a worse uh, subtype. The survival rate of in this disease, again, it's uh, less than 30% if you have a metastatic disease. So, as I showed earlier, that we, from this study, the, uh, uh, we, we discovered this FGFR4 is highly expressed in the rhabdomyosarcoma uh, tumors. And again, what is the FGFR4? It's a tyrosine kinase self-surface receptor overexpressed in all the uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. And the later uh, from a polymerase group, they demonstrated that this, PEC, uh, this molecule is a direct target of PEC3 4CAT uh, fusion gene. That's the reason it's very high in the fusion positive. And this molecule also expressed during the muscle development, normal muscle development. And uh, it's induced in the regenerating of the muscle after injury, and not expressed in the mature muscle. Suggests the possible roles in the myogenic stem cells, and also possible the oncogenic roles in, the, in, this, in this tumor. So the specific aim for this project is first to determine if FGFR4 expression level is associated with the high stage of survival in the uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. And uh, also we want to sequence this molecule to identify if there's any mutation in this cancer. And subsequently, we have to study the biological consequence of the overexpression of this molecule and also the, uh, uh, the mutation of this body. What is the consequence? And uh, another important thing is we want to uh, verify if this is uh, a good therapeutic target for the rhabdomyosin. And this is a Kaplan-Meier curve shows the expression of uh, FGFR4 does uh, predict the outcome. So this uh, is a high expression of the FGFR, F, FGFR4, and this is a low expression. You can see the, if they are significantly different in terms of survival. And if we knock down this molecule using an SHRNA uh, under the uh, doxycycline uh, induction, inducing uh, 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 control the promoter, you can see the knockdown uh, of this molecule resulted in uh, reduced uh, growth in, in, in this uh, xenograft model. Also, the knockdown of this molecule caused uh, less uh, metastasis in, in this animal model also. So then we ask, is uh, FGFR4 mutated in the RMS. If it's mutated, are they acting, activating mutation? So this is a, a big experiment that we condense into one slide because we sequenced about uh, 100 samples 
uh, are uh, randomized atoma samples uh, of FR, uh, FGFR4 using the Sanger sequencing. At the same time, we use the 1,030 health individual DNA to sequence this as a control. So we found that uh, about 7.5 RMS have, uh, a tyrus, uh, have mutations in tyrus kinase domain. So with a very significant p value. And we also sequenced the germline DNA corresponding to those patients, but we do not find the mutations in the germline, uh, germline of those patients. So this, those are the somatic mutations. Uh, and there's uh, two uh, uh, common hotspots in the parasitic kinase domain. One is called the K535, another is one is V550E. So we took these two uh, hotspot mutations and put it into a, a mirroring RMS cell lines uh, to do the individual and individual work, characterize what those mutations affect the cells. So this this slide shows uh, these two mutations can cause autophosphorylation. So without the ligand, it can autophosphorylate itself. That means it can self-activate this separate cell. And uh, also these two mutations cause uh, uh, faster growth in vitro and in vivo. This is a mouse study. Uh, these two mutations cause faster growth uh, of the tumor cell. And in addition, we are uh, using the mouse model to see the, the this is the metastatic model. We inject it into the tail vein of the mouse and to observe if uh, the lung mass is increased. So indeed, these two uh, uh, mutants cause a, a highly increased number of metast metastatic nodules in the lungs. This model. So this is the vector control and the wild type FGFR4. And then there's a um, small molecule uh, to inhibit the uh, tyrosine kinase. So this uh, AP24534 uh, is developed uh, by this uh, array of pharmaceuticals. At that time, uh, it's also called a uh, uh, this is an oral active uh, model kinase inhibitor. Okay. If you look at uh, its chemical uh, property, you can see this is a all nano, this is a nanomolar uh, inhibitor for a bunch of kinase. Okay. So we thought we can use this to uh, inhibit the function of the FGFR4. And uh, this is uh, the expression expression of uh, FGFR4 in multiple uh, sarcomas, pediatric sarcomas. Uh, you can see this is uh, not only in the RMS, which is the uh, embryonic form and the alveolar form, but also uh, expressed in other uh, cancers. This is uh, the DRCT tumors and the sum in the viewing sarcoma. So we think probably if we, if we can inhibit the function of this, it's not only uh, use, uh, benefit the patient with the rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, probably they can benefit to, to other cancers. And uh, this slide shows that the sensitivity to, to this uh, inhibitor is the inverse of the FGR4 expression. That means the higher the uh, expression, the, the more sensitive uh, the cells towards this inhibitor. So the future direction, we are doing uh, several projects with this, uh, uh, this molecule. Is the first we use uh, sRNA screening of multiple cell lines to identify the uh, uh, synthetical lethality with the combination of this inhibitor. And another way is we use the, uh, we develop the antibody or uh, chimeric 
uh, antigen receptor, which is CAR, uh, to against this uh, molecule as a immune therapy. And uh, so we, we also to try to use uh, uh, this uh, inhibitor to do the pre uh, precision therapy uh, for, for the uh, rhabdomyosarcoma with the, uh, this FGR4 R4 activation. Either you have a mutation activation or amplification of this molecule using, using this inhibitor. So in summary, the FGLFR4 is a diagnostic marker in the uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, and the highly expressed uh, of these molecules associated with the uh, adverse outcome. And the inhibition of the wild type result in the reduced growth uh, of the tumor and also reduce the lung metastasis. And the first report this is the first report of the mutation in the receptor kinase kinase domain uh, of, a, of a receptor uh, in the RMS. And 7.5% of the tumor having this kind of uh, mutation uh, in this tumor. So potentially, those are the patients that they, are, they could benefit the inhibition of this uh, molecule. So the mutation resulting in the trans transformation, increased growth, serial-free survival, invasion, and the metastasis of the tumor. And the cell harbors those mutations will show increase the sensitivity of the pharmacological inhibition of, the, of this molecule. And uh, so all those studies indicated that this inhibitor of this molecule may be beneficial for the patient with the rhabdomyosarcoma. So I'm going to shift the gear a little bit to, talk, uh, to tell you about the, this technology. It's called a massively parallel the sequencing, also called the next generation sequencing. So this is the um, latest technology uh, to, I think, it's replaced uh, the microarray. So this slide shows uh, how this technology works. Uh, here is uh, uh, genomic DNA or RNA. You can just uh, use uh, using chemical or mechanical fragmentation to make it into, into small pieces. And uh, with a size selection, and the clone into an adapter. Uh, and then you can use the adapter uh, to put on the sequencer to sequence all the insert molecules. And after the sequencing, you can use computer uh, to align those sequences to the reference genome. Then you will reconstruct original molecule in this sequence. Okay, that's the general principle of the next generation sequence. The concept is the same. It is the same as the shotgun sequencing in the in, in, in the early days. You, know, you just chop up the DNA randomly. I sequence each each pieces and then you put them together at the county. So this is the uh, platform of next generation sequencing out there. Um, it, so with the competition and the natural selection, so uh, nowadays I think uh, uh, most of people is uh, uh, favored this uh, Illumina platform, which is the uh, next seek 500 and the high seek uh, 2500 uh, for the next generation secret experiments uh, experiment. and uh, also live ha has another uh, technology called the uh, semiconductor sequencing so they don't need uh, complicated optics or dyes to sequence those molecules instead they use uh, uh, this semiconductor wafer to sequence to sequence the molecule. And uh, these two are the most uh, common platform. One is called the ion torrent, PGM. This is called the proton. So uh, both platform now shrinking the sequence time into a very short time. The original uh, first human genome sequencing 
human project spent about 13 years and uh, about 3 billion base pair to sequence one genome. But currently, if you use this kind of technology, you can sequence a whole genome with about $2,000. And it's only about two days you can finish a whole genome. And the projected is uh, this cost and the time will be even reduced to about $100 per genome in one, uh, less than an hour. So this is a very powerful technology. And this slide just show you <laughs> Uh, image from the uh, Illumina sequencer. So you can see each little dot is equivalent to one piece of Sanger sequencer. Okay, and then, <clears throat> this is only a very tiny field of the whole slide. You can imagine on these slides you can sequence billions, uh, billions, billions of uh, little DNA fragments. So the throughput is very, very uh, high in those sequencers. What kind of information you get from the sequencing uh, experiment? So this slide shows that uh, you can detect the single point mutation or the indel because uh, after you align with your reference, if you don't have anything aligned this part, this is the indel. And also you can detect the hom homologous uh, uh, deletion or uh, hemozygous deletion. So just to reduce the coverage of your uh, uh, sequence, sequences in, in your sample. Or you can detect the gain of the, uh, the DNAs. And uh, in this case, you can, you can detect those abnormal junction, which in the normal genome, you won't have a piece of DNA coming from two different chromosomes. But if you have a translocation happening, and you will detect those abnormal junctions in your reads. And another uh, application is you can uh, discover the non-human sequences in your sample that indicate that there's a pathogen, maybe a viral sequence or bacterial sequence in uh, the sample. And this is the RNA sequencing. If you sequence this RNA molecule because of the intron, exon, uh, organization of the mature uh, of the RNA gene, then you can get uh, all this information. You can uh, you can get the gene expression information just like a microarray, and then you can detect the express mutation to see if a mutation is expressed or not in your sample. And also, you can uh, uh, know what is the alternative splicing event. Okay, so what kind of transcript be detected in your Samples. And you can de detect the express the fusion transcripts and also RNA editing bank and the novel transcript and the, uh, currently another hot area is the coding RNA. Those are the RNA uh, has a very important regulatory function. So the power of this technology is uh, you this you know, you have all these different samples, okay? But you can use the same platform to do all the experiments. I get all the information I just mentioned. So one platform, you can get all different kinds of information with different samples. That's the power of this platform. And uh, here I want to use this, uh, uh, our very first sequencing uh, study to introduce you how do how do we use this next generation sequencing to identify not novel targets in a patient? So this is a patient of a neuro, high-risk neuroblastoma. And uh, when she was diagnosed, uh, diagnosed, she's already 18, uh, 19 years old. So this is a very not a typical uh, neuroblastoma. Usually neuroblastoma patient is uh, uh, is diagnosed with cancers within the first five years of their uh, life. Okay, so very young kids or even infants, they born with this disease. But this patient is uh, 19 years old. Uh, and at the diagnosis, we acquired a bone marrow uh, biopsy from this patient. That's what we call the uh, MAT1 
bone marrow. And uh, after four months, very intense therapy. So those in therapy usually is very tox toxic. Okay, they they use uh, uh, multiple chemo agent try to uh, kill as many as uh, tumor as possible. And uh, but unfortunately, she didn't respond to the uh, treatment well. So they have to take off the tumor from her adren uh, adrenal gland uh, because the tumor is too big. It's uh, start compress her vital organ. So this is the second uh, pieces of uh, tumors we got from this patient. And she went on with uh, three years more therapy, you know, very toxic, toxic therapy, all different kinds of therapy. Eventually, unfortunately, he, she's uh, died of disease. At the autopsy, we acquired a liver mass from this patient. So with this patient, we have, uh, 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 we, we have tumor samples from a different stage of her disease. So first the question we want to ask at that time is, can we use next generation sequencing technology to, to identify a therapeutic target in a patient? Another question is, uh, uh, with, this, uh, with this kind of sample, we probably can see if the tumor will, will be the same or they become different you know, after three, three something years treatment, are they going to be the different? So in this study, we use the combined whole genome sequencing and the transcriptome sequencing to answer these questions. And here is the experimental design. And we use this MAT2, which is the autopsy sample as an uh, index case. Uh, and we uh, perform the whole genome sequencing with the germline DNA, which is the scan biopsy from this patient. And uh, we identify the somatic uh, uh, variants, and then we go back to the primary tumor, because the tumor is quite big, and we take different sections from different parts of the tumor to see if we can see the same kind of uh, 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 somatic variants in those uh, original uh, primary tumor. And then we found that actually we have uh, uh, some common uh, variants we can identify, but interestingly we found uh, a lot of uh, unique variants just for this, uh, this uh, liver mat. I will tell you uh, a little bit uh, in detail later. So this is an overview of the whole genome sequencing of this uh, liver mat. And this is called the circus, cir uh, circle circle plot, which uh, have a different track to summarize all the whole genome uh, sequencing information in uh, uh, this one, one uh, figure. So this other uh, track denotes all the uh, somatic mutations in this uh, tumor. And uh, here is the copy number of the chromosome. You can see there's a lot of copy number changes in this patient. And this track is shows this uh, track shows the heterozygous um, uh, variant allele frequency of each variant in this uh, in this uh, tumor. And here is the track that shows the lot of heterozygosity of the uh, of the uh, genome. You can see this uh, uh, chromosome three is totally lost the heterozygosity. That means they lost. Uh, a copy, you, compared to the adjacent uh, chromosome, it lost the one copy, okay? And this uh, most inner track, that uh, denoted the uh, abnormal junctions. So you can see there's junctions uh, across uh, inter-chromosome or intra-chromosome. So it's a very complicated change in the cancer genome. And also we detect the, the uh, complicated rearrangement within a short uh, pieces of DNA. So this is like on chromosome four and 13. It's only like a two or three megabase, but you can see there's a lot of abnormal junction happening here. So in the literature, this is a type of uh, uh, 
phenomenon is called the uh, homothorpsis, means shattering of the genome. And so they have, in that case, they uh, when the cancer genome try to repair themselves, they generate uh, many those abnormal junctions in a very defined field. Uh, Defend the stretch of the uh, DNA. So th this shows uh, how easy you can detect this, something that is, in the past is very difficult to, to detect in a tumor sample. This shows just the simple coverage of uh, the reads from the whole genome sequencing. Uh, on this X chromosome in this region. So this gene has been reported is uh, mutated. Most of is a deletion mutation in about 40% of adolescent and young adult neuroblastoma patients, which fit to our patient's profile. And uh, indeed, we detect, uh, you, you can see this is a normal coverage, but in this stretch, it's about uh, 15,000 uh, base. You have a... Uh, reduce the coverage. That is implicated that there's a, a, a deletion of, a, a, of the chromosome in this region, which is not easy to detect in the past. With this kind of, uh, uh, because this resolution, we can detect it easily. And we designed the uh, genomic PCR primer to, uh, to, verif uh, to verify this uh, deletion. You can see this deletion uh, abnormal junction can be only detected in, the, in this uh, index sample and also in this uh, primary tumor and the original tumor, but not in the normal liver or normal skin. And the way sequence verify this. So this table, um, this is not meant for you to see the details, but it gives you a sense this red, uh, each line is one uh, somatic variance detected in this patient. And all the red variants are the shared uh, variants in all the tumors, which those black variants uh, are the unique variants in this ma uh, the liver mass. You can see that the, this shared variant actually is a minority. So one third are common, but the two thirds of the variance actually is only unique to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, liver mass. That implicated that there's a, a rapid accumulation of de novo mutation, de novo somatic mutation in this uh, patient. So only three years, about three years treatment, this, uh, this tumor accumulates about two thirds of uh, more mutation. So, we combined with the expression of the tumor to see which gene, or which variants are uh, expressed at a high level. So here, uh, this is all the shared mutation, and this is all the unique mutation. Uh, and uh, this is the RPKM, which indicates how much this gene expressed in the tumor. And here we're only using the, uh, or we can detect the, the variant allele frequent, uh, fraction in this RNA seq. So how much variant expressed in the RNA samples? And uh, then we detect that this uh, this molecule called the LPAR1 is highly expressed in the tumor, and also the variant allele is highly expressed in the tumor too. So this molecule is a G protein coupled receptor. The receptor it's a sit on the top of uh, many important pathway. This is important in neuron development, and also important for the cell migration, the cell differentiation, and the cell survival. This mutation is exactly at the the second intracellular domain and the transmembrane domain junction and they're predicted to be deleterious. And the way clone the wild type and as well as mutant are put in the 3T3 cells. And the, we performed the microarray experiment to see what kind of pathways are upregulated. And here we can see that this is GSEA uh, analysis. 
and it shows that the, the directional cell motility genes uh, is upregulated, both at the one hour uh, stimulation with the uh, LPAR1 uh, ligand, um, as well as the, with the serum itself. And another category is the role pathway is upregulated. So that will um, make us think that uh, this mutation probably is important in the cell motility, in the regulation of cell motility. So ne next we, we look at the cell, this is 3T3 cells uh, behavior in the culture. And uh, this is a cell growth assay. You can see um, with different kind of uh, uh, phytocap serum, serum uh, the wild type and the mutant, they grow in exactly the same fashion. They, uh, they, there's no difference in growth, in terms of growth. But if we put in, uh, if we put those cells in a void chamber, which is a measured cell invasion assay, we can see immediately the mutant has elevated the cell invasion capability, uh, either under the chemo, uh, either under the uh, FBS as a chemotaxin, or under the LPA as a chemotaxin. And then this uh, 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 activation of this molecule, uh, if we put the LPA, which is the uh, ligand of this uh, molecule into the system, you can see that it, this uh, row kinase, the activated uh, uh, row molecule, is upregulated as as uh, short as five minutes. Okay, all this, so so that means the row kind uh, row pathway is uh, is activated uh, by this uh, mutant form. Uh, it's much more than this uh, wild type uh, exact control. And uh, we cloned the uh, uh, SRE, which is a serum res responsive element, which is a downstream of this row pathway. We cloned this uh, luciferase cassettes into the cells, and you can see this uh, response is a, uh, with a dose responsive uh, fashion. If you increase the, the ligand, you can see more activity. So from this experiment, we, we see this uh, variance is really signal, signaling through the row rock pathway. And if we use a row kinase inhibitor, uh, Y27623, uh, and we can really stop the uh, the wound healing. So this is the uh, media, the, uh, and this is the vehicle control, and this is the, with this uh, inhibitor. You can see the totally inhibited this process. So we, we think this migration, this uh, uh, mutant receptor mediated, uh, mediated migratory phenotype is mediated through this low pathway. So in another uh, publication with this uh, whole genome sequencing of the high-risk neuroblastoma, and in this study, they all also uh, found that this row pathway uh, is uh, uh, mutated. Not the molecule we discovered, but it is downstream of this row pathway. Uh, so those kind of mutation will result in a... Uh, uh, heightened uh, uh, row signaling, and uh, which tip the balance of the row rack signaling, so will cause the net effect is the collapse of the neuron both cone, which is uh, prevented the uh, differentiation of the new neuron, but, pro uh, but, prevent, uh, but promote the, the uh, migra migration of the uh, cells. So this study is a is really support uh, what we found with, with our study. So in summary, I just show you that the whole genome sequencing 
we showed that the massive chromosome alterations together with a small set of somatically acquired mutation in this uh, liver mass. And the examination of the somatic mutation in additional tumor samples revealed is a rapid, rapid accumulation of de novo mutation in these liver bats during the therapy. And the parallel whole genome sequencing and the transcriptional sequencing identified a cell motility, motility driver mutation in this LPAR1 gene and suggested that such a combination, uh, such a combination of this approach will be uh, very powerful to use the uh, precision therapy to identify the driver mutation. And this study also shows the role pathway activation may play an important role in the high-risk neuroblastoma. So where we go with this uh, kind of study is to really using these uh, genomic tools to enable individualized therapy. This is the future of the pediatric uh, clinical trials. So we can, you know, as I said earlier, the problem of the pediatric cancer is the, this metastatic disease. And now we can use these uh, genomic biomarkers to tell which are the patients that it has a good signature to responsible, uh, to responsive to the standard therapy. And for those poor uh, signature uh, type of uh, patient, uh, we can use the, this next, next generation sequencing uh, technology to identify their driver mutations and then put them into the targeted individualized uh, therapies. Hopefully this approach, uh, we can improve the therapy. So those uh, 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 genomic alterations, including the amplification mutation, translocation, overexpression, and the alternative splice the genes that all can be detected by this technology. So th this is a, these two are currently active, uh, the, the clinical protocol uh, within our branch. So this is a, this protocol is, is a comprehensive omic analysis of pediatric solid tumor and they establish a repository for the related biological studies. The, the idea is we collect all the uh, patient materials from the patient treated in the clinic so that we can uh, first using this to build a, a tumor bank so we can study what is the genomic change in all these tumor treated in the pediatric model. And these are the schematic uh, things. We take the blood, the frozen tumors, and the uh, formally fixed the tumors, and the other specimen to archive in the freezer for the research, research purpose. And from this blood, we can extract the germline DNA, and the fresh tumors, we uh, extract the DNA, RNA, to perform next generation sequencing to identify the target of the uh, the therapeutic targets. And this slide shows that uh, currently uh, the CCR leadership test uh, our branch to build this uh, clinical cleomic core to use this sequencing technology using uh, to provide information in clinic. So if the patient refer to the CCR enrolling, uh, enrolling in the protocol, and then we can obtain the tissues from the patient, and we can uh, acquire the germline data, somatic data, and also the research data. And all those data will be kept in a database, so, uh, so those data can provide the clinician with uh, the information they can uh, use in the clinical to perform precision therapy. And at the same time, we can use those database to uh, do the genomic research uh, in, in, in our research uh, area. So this is an ongoing project. We, we just started, uh, uh, started from this uh, summer of this year. 
So hopefully we can have the first sequencing out of this core by early next year. So in conclusion, uh, the integrated analysis of the cancer genome will identify the biologically relevant diagnostic, diagnostic, prognostic biomarkers and novel targets for therapy. And these uh, powerful emergency tool, uh, emerging tools of generation, next generation sequencing will determine the complete, complete genomic portrait of those cancers at the base level resolution within the next two or five years. There's so many studies now coming out with this, using this uh, technology. So uh, our knowledge of those cancers is really rapidly improved uh, in, in all these areas. So this will lead to the identif identification of the key drivers and will enable the development of future novel therapies. So this is a slide of technology. This is uh, because of this uh, uh, com complexity of the system, also the technology, and this is truly a team science. This is uh, our section with a, a big group of biologists. Biologists uh, perform the well lab experiment, and the other biomedicians uh, provide the biomedic support, and uh, also the James. James Taylor has performed the FGFR4 study, and the Silvio uh, Goodkind, the Chippy, uh, is to help us with the LPR, LPR1 characterization, and the stick, uh, pad stick, and the Marshall, they are also contributed to the LPR1 study, and uh, also the Glenn Marino group give us uh, help with the uh, low kinase activation. So I will stop here. If there's any question, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah. Yeah. It is, uh, all those experiments that shows it uh, drives uh, 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 faster growth as well as metastasis. So in the lung mass, in the animal model, we showed that it, it does uh, cause more metastasis. Uh, yeah. 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 Not yet. So currently this drug is in the clinical, I think the phase two trials uh, for other some other disease. Uh, but uh, I haven't really put it yet. But it's on the way. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's a, a little bit of tricky number to give because, uh, you know, the transcriptome is a little bit different because uh, you have genes very highly expressed and you have genes very uh, at the low level. So if you want to use this technology to detect all the low level expressed transcript, you need to sequence a lot. Okay. And then your sequence, most of your sequence is those highly abundant genes. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, so so depends what kind of question you ask. Yeah, usually, yeah. So so let me give you some number. Probably makes uh, make you make you have more uh, a clear idea. So currently, we sequence about uh, five to ten gigabase sequencing to this RNA sequencing. And we have enough coverage for expression and the detection of the uh, fusion. 
okay, and the detection of different transcripts. And the ways highly expressed mutation, 5 to 10 gig sequencing, it's, it's okay to, usually it's okay to detect. But again, if it's lowly expressed gene, then it's hard. Okay, for example, transcription factor. Okay, it doesn't express at a very high level, but they are very important, right? So in that case, usually what we do is we look at the DNA side. Okay, we, we, we do the whole exome sequencing on the DNA. If we detect the mutation, we go to the RNA and say, hey, can we see this variant in the RNA? That, yeah, yeah. For genome sequence, what do you mean genome? Uh, just the DNA. Um, if you sequence, usually, if you want to call, confidently call a uh, mutation, at least you need to have 30 to 40x coverage. Okay? And in cancer, it's even worse because cancer, you have this aneuploidy. That's the thing is really hard. You, you know, sometimes you, you, you got a deletion, right? You only have one copy. And sometimes you have this, uh, you know, seven copies, you know, on the tetraploidy, triploidy. Then your mutation is only one third or one quarter of your whole genomic DNA. So that's the difficulty is in the uh, sequencing of the cancer gene. So it all depends what kind of question you ask. So in the field now, people think if you sequence the cancer genome, you, you, get, you need to get at least 100x coverage to detect the mutation. So you, you lower the, it's all. Yeah, exactly. That's another problem, contamination of the normal, right? So that's another thing. So it's all this balance you have to trade offs. Okay, thank you very much.